Eighty-five, Covenant Freedom. According to Jacob Jots, election in the Bible is a basic theological concept and is inseparable from the biblical doctrine of God. It must be understood in terms of responsibility rather than privilege, and refers to divine degree as the expression of God's saving will. But in this context. Election is only another aspect of the covenant, for it bears witness to God's unfailing grace toward mankind. He also stresses the fact that law and covenants are inseparably linked. Moreover, there can be no redemption in history unless personal redemption affects society. Salvation that does not impinge upon the life of the community. Is not salvation in the Christian sense? Responsibility is thus basic to election and the covenant. Salvation requires the exercise of dominion and responsibility, and the law of God is essential to covenant life. Let us now turn to a radically different subject: a bird known in the King James version as a swallow. Psalm eighty-four, verse three; Proverbs chapter twenty-six, verse two. It is known in the Near East and Europe also as a swift, a black martinet, and in some parts of France as le juif or the Jew. It's a high-flying, unweariable bird of great wing power and a soaring freedom. The Hebrew word for this swallow is dror, which means freedom. Elsewhere in the Bible, dror or deror is translated as liberty. Leviticus chapter twenty-five, verse ten; Isaiah chapter sixty-one, verse one; Jeremiah chapter thirty-four, verse eight; verse fifteen and verse seventeen; Ezekiel chapter forty-six, verse seventeen. Now, Leviticus chapter twenty-five, verse one declares. And ye shall hallow the fiftieth year, and proclaim liberty throughout all the land unto all the inhabitants thereof. It shall be a jubilee unto you, and ye shall return every man unto his possessions, and ye shall return every man unto his family. It is immediately apparent that the biblical idea of freedom is very different from the concept held by humanists and other pagans. Such people associate freedom with deliverance from responsibility, from work, family, worship, and various ties. For them, the more atomistic and unrelated man is to his context, the freer he is. It is a natural consequence of this idea of freedom that modern man has a communications problem. He cuts himself off from all other peoples. And he makes any tie between them untenable, because he is in principle opposed to any tie. Speech then becomes not communication, but an attempt to impress and to sell one's person as an important figure. A dwelling place is then not a home; it is furnished to make an impression conducive to our self-image. Restaurants become not congenial places to eat good food with. Relaxed and easy conversation, but places that will conform to people's images of themselves as modern, free, avant-garde, and prosperous. Everything then is stage setting for the individual's play acting. Clothing becomes more and more theatrical, and as in the theatre, quick changes of costume are necessary to conform to changing moods and scenes. All such quote. Freedom end quote traps a man in the narrow room of his own being. The jubilee proclamation is radically different. The servant has security, not freedom. He is a responsibility, not a responsible person. The jubilee sets him free for a return to responsibility, a return to his possessions and to his family. He is now a covenant man, an elder in Israel, with a responsibility to exercise headship and dominion over his family, 
possessions and calling. This, for Scripture, is freedom, drawer. St. James speaks of those who are hearers and doers of God's law word as blessed or happy. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, or a doer that works, this man is blessed in his deed or doing. James chapter 1 verse 25 Liberty is here equated with law and work. Quite obviously, when the Bible and modern man both speak of freedom, they speak of two radically opposite things or ideas. The freedom sought by modern man is to be his own God, having aseity, self-being, self-sufficiency, needing nothing and no one, and yet able to command all. The freedom of man in Scripture is the freedom to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever by being His elect, responsible and working dominion man. Paradise, the Garden of Eden, was created as a place for work and the curse on man for his rebellion was a curse on his work. Instead of being his arena of joyful and fruitful dominion, it became an area of frustration. For covenant man, however, it is again an area of dominion and joy, of satisfaction and advance. The Jubilee is thus rightly a type of heaven and of the new creation. It means the end of captivity and bondage, and the glorious liberty of the sons of God to serve God freely and without impediment. Romans chapter 8 verse 21, Revelation chapter 22 verse 3. We must remember, too, the very personal and involved nature of Jubilee freedom. Ye shall return every man unto his family. Leviticus chapter 25 verse 10. Freedom is into the covenant family and into possessions. Both of these facts are very important. For Scripture, neither family nor possessions, when covenantal, are impediments. When alien to the covenants, they are to be forsaken. Matthew chapter 19, verses 35 to 37. Luke chapter 14, verses 26 and 33. Not otherwise. The Jubilee freedom thus restores man to the context of responsibility, to family and to possessions, to work and to obligations, and it is this which manifests that he is indeed regenerated and renewed in the image of God. It is covenantal responsibility which leads to God's blessing and our freedom under God. Wherefore ye shall do my statutes, and keep my judgments, and do them, and ye shall dwell in the land in safety. And the land shall yield her fruit, and ye shall eat your fill, and dwell therein in safety. Leviticus chapter 25, verses 18 and 19. When men believe and obey God, then they have both freedom and security or safety. Security and freedom are opposites in a humanistic world. In Scripture, they are both products of God's law. But the Jubilee is not only an aspect of God's law, it is the culmination of God's Sabbath. A man only keeps God's law if, first of all, he knows God's Sabbath or rest, to know and obey God's Sabbath means to take hands off our lives and to commit them to Christ, acknowledging Him to be our Lord and Saviour, King of creation. To keep the Sabbath means to walk in the assurance that He is Lord and that it is His will, not ours, which shall prevail. It means that we recognise that our work is our freedom under God and our duty to Him, but it is God's ordination which produces the results. A Psalm of Solomon, 
Psalm 127, stresses this in verse 2. It is vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows, for so he giveth his beloved sleep. Anxiety can rob us of rest and peace. It cannot give us what we long for. Solomon's name was also Jedediah, the beloved of the Lord, 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 25. Moreover, in a dream, God promised the sleeping Solomon wisdom, honour and prosperity, 1 Kings chapter 3, verses 5 to 15. God rewards and blesses us, not for anxieties, but for our trusting, working faith. The Jubilee is thus a Sabbath. Before it can give its bounty to the released and the releasers, there must be that faith which lives in Sabbath peace and rests under God. Sabbath keeping is thus much more than a keeping of a church day. It is a working faith in every area of life. 